All right, welcome back, everybody. Today, we're going to begin to look at game theory, which is one way that economists try to make some sense out of this market structure known as oligopoly. And so uh, the information is in your book and chapter 15 on the pages that are listed on the screen. And uh, we're going to try and understand how oligopoly is, ex uh, is explained by using game theory. And we'll explore this idea of what's known as a prisoner's dilemma. And uh, we'll discuss how to read and interpret um, payoff matrices in order to identify dominant strategies and figure out what the best um, action is given a, a, a given scenario. So let's go ahead and start by looking at this the classic example in game theory which is known as the prisoner's dilemma. And in the prisoner's dilemma the setup is that you're arrested uh, with a partner and there's enough evidence for them to throw you in jail for one year. Um, and They know you've committed worse crimes uh, that would lead to 20 years in prison but they don't have enough information to get you um, convicted and so they separate you and your partner and and they tell you both separately that if you confess they'll set you free and the your partner will serve the 20 years um, and but if you both confess then you'll each get uh, three years in jail so what do you what do you do um, and so the the classic setup is um, is is formed where we look at prisoner one and prisoner two and we say well you have two choices either confess or don't confess and we begin to develop what's known as a payoff matrix, where we see if we both confess, then we get negative three or three years in jail. If I confess uh, and, and you don't, then uh, I go free and you go to jail for 20 years. If you confess and I don't, then I go to jail for 20 years and you go free. And if neither of us say anything, then we both get one year in jail. And so uh, the end result is that the, the best strategy for both me and you uh, is to confess, even though, um, even though by just being quiet, we both are in a better situation, we're gonna go ahead and confess. Now, why is that the case? Well, that gets into how to interpret and read the payoff matrix. So um, what is a payoff matrix? Well, and what is game theory? Game theory is a way to understand how interdependent firms or interdependent people make decisions. So each one of us is independent. We get to make our own decisions, but our decisions can impact others. <clears throat> and so game theory helps us to try and sort out um, what the right action is. So the payoff matrix is the, uh, the setup that we had that tells us what value I receive and what value you receive for decisions that we make. So we can look at a different payoff matrix. Uh, in this case, we'll look at Coca-Cola and Pepsi. And we could say we have two choices in the world of marketing. We can either advertise or we cannot advertise. The goal is for us to find what is known as our dominant strategy, which is the best strategy that we should follow regardless of what the other player does. And so in this play, uh, payoff matrix, what we see is the first number in each square represents the payoff that Pepsi receives and the second number is the payoff that Coca-Cola receives. And so Coke needs to decide whether they should advertise or not. So they want to find their dominant strategy. Which choice gives me the, the best outcome regardless of what Pepsi chooses to do? And so we could look and we could say if uh, Pepsi chooses to advertise, then uh, if Coke advertises, it gets 80 points. And if Coke doesn't advertise, they only get 45. And so from a Coca-Cola perspective, the best option if Pepsi chooses to advertise is to also advertise because 80 is greater than 45. If Pepsi chooses not to advertise and Coke advertises, they get 120 points essentially of happiness. And if they don't advertise, they only get 100. So in the case where Pepsi chooses not to advertise, Coke's best option is also to advertise. So from their perspective, Coca-Cola's dominant strategy is to go ahead and advertise because regardless of what Pepsi does, the best option for Coke is to put money into marketing and advertising. And we could look at this also from the perspective of Pepsi. And we could say, well, if uh, Coke chooses to advertise, then Pepsi's best option is also to advertise because 80 is greater than 45. And if Coke chooses not to advertise, again, Pepsi's option, best option would be to put money into marketing because 120 is greater than 100. And so both companies have a dominant strategy, which is to advertise. And so uh, both of them will pursue that dominant strategy. And when they do that, they enter into what is known as a Nash equilibrium. 
Another example of the payoff matrix is one from uh, uh, ancient history, and, and there's this, this uh, philosopher named Pascal who offered what's known as Pascal's wager, which is in a sense a form of uh, game theory as he was trying to cre create an argument for the existence of God. So looking outside of economics just to see another example of how this might work, uh, Pascal said, really, there's two options. Either God exists or God does not exist. And we either believe uh, that God exists or he does not, essentially. So if uh, we believe that God exists, and it turns out he really does, there's infinite reward. Uh, if we think that uh, God doesn't exist and he does, that's a huge loss. Uh, presumably you get thrown into the pits of hell or something like that. Um, if we believe God exists and he doesn't, you lose nothing. And if you uh, believe no God exists and there is no God, you don't gain anything either. No gain, no reward. So from Pascal's perspective, his argument uh, essentially boils down to that your your dominant strategy, the best outcome you can hope for is is in fact that um, is is to choose or to choose to believe in the existence of God with the hope that you get the the huge reward at the end. Um, so it's kind of just another example outside of econ of how people sort of use this idea of game theory to try and make some sense of the world. Now this Nash equilibrium exists when both players choose to follow their dominant strategy. Um, and in that case, there's no incentive to change because it's the best option you can have regardless of what the other person um, is doing. And so um, that's where, where both, both uh, players in the game will end up if they have dominant strategies. Now, is it the optimal strategy? No. If we went back to the Pepsi and Coke example, the best possible outcome for Pepsi and Coke is that neither one advertises because they both get 100. But they follow their dominant strategies, and as a result, they end up with something that's less than the optimal output, but it's the one that makes the most sense for them uh, given their dominant strategy. So in the end, both Coke and Pepsi will choose to advertise even though it's not uh, the best possible outcome. And we can look at another example. Let's pretend that there's a small town, and in that small town there are only two gas stations, Margaret's Quick Stop and Pam's Pump Station. And they have a choice. They can choose to either price their gasoline high or price their gasoline low. And so we have the payoff matrix for both of them. So Pam needs to decide how she's going to price. So she can look and say, well, if Margaret prices her gasoline high, then uh, my best option is to price low because I get only get $80 if I price high, I'll get $100 if I price it low. And if Margaret prices her gasoline low and I price mine high, I get $50, but if I price low, I get 60. So in both cases, regardless of what Margaret does, whether it's high or low, the best thing for Pam to do is to price her gasoline low. And then we could look at Margaret's and we could say, okay, what should Margaret do? Well, if Pam chooses to set her gas prices high, then Margaret's better off if she prices low. And if Pam sets her price low, then Margaret's best off at a lower price. And so Margaret's dominant strategy is also to price low. So both stations will choose to lower the price of gas and end up at their Nash equilibrium. There is no incentive for them to change. Because if Margaret chooses to price her gasoline high, she loses, and the same with Pam. So they settle into this Nash equilibrium where they stay. Is it optimal? No. They'd both prefer to price high and get $80, but their dominant strategy is to get to 60. So what should they do? Um, the answer is that they should collude or work with each other. And how do they work with each other? Well, they could work to, with each other by creating a formal agreement where they both promise, uh, as a, almost like a contract, that they're going to go ahead and keep their prices high. Unfortunately for Margaret and Pam, those types of agreements in virtually every uh, industrialized country in the world are illegal. So you can't make a formal agreement. So we have what's known as tacit collusion. There's collusion involved, but there's not a formal agreement to it. And one of the tricks, though, with tacit collusion is that you have to work together to build up trust. It takes multiple rounds, because if you're only going to play the pricing game once, then you have a very strong incentive to cheat. But if you're going to keep working and playing the game over and over and over again, and every day have to set a new price for your gasoline, whether high or low, there's a very strong incentive for you to play along and work well with each other. 
But if somebody does decide to cheat, there is what we call a tit-for-tat strategy. The tit-for-tat strategy basically says, I will reward your cooperation when you cooperate by, by playing along, and I will punish you if you choose to cheat um, in the next round. So if Pam and Margaret choose to price high, if Pam prices high, I'll price high if I'm Margaret. If Margaret sets her price high and Pam decides to cheat and price low, then the next day Margaret's best option is to price low in order to punish Pam. Because if Pam decides to go ahead and price high again, Margaret wins, and if she doesn't, then Margaret doesn't lose. Um, and so this idea of tit-for-tat strategy of reward when you do well, punish when you don't, is one way to help make sure that you are uh, continuing on with your tacit collusion. There are several examples that we will continue to look at. We'll continue to discuss oligopoly and, and game theory in the next couple of days. And um, we'll look forward to seeing you in class.